everyone uh, welcome to the 30 minute webinar titled an introduction to long fiber injection thanks for joining us my name is brian graves and i'm joined here with matt getty the vice president of product and business development hi matt hey everyone uh, today we'll be discussing all things long fiber injection uh, our agenda is uh, going to be, we're going to describe what LFI is. Uh, we're going to describe the LFI process, the advantages of using LFI, and we're going to see some real life examples of LFI in the field. Um, and we're going to go fast because there's a lot of information in here. We'll try to uh, be respectful of your time and keep it to 30 minutes. So but before we get started, I want to mention that this is a webinar will be recorded and there will be a link emailed to you for future reference or sharing. And if you like the subject matter, we actually encourage you to share this among your social circle and your colleagues. Um, secondly, we'll be answering questions at the conclusion of the presentation, which should last again no longer than 30 minutes. Feel free to submit the questions you may have in the field provided. Um, there's a question dash um, drop down in your dashboard. Um, and then finally, uh, I encourage you to stay to the end of this webinar because we have some bonus material to share with you that I hope that I think will help save you some time in future projects. So with that, let's get started. Matt, can you give us a quick summary of Romeo Rim? Absolutely. Thanks, Brian. So to kick it off here, uh, first again, of course, thank you everyone for joining us on this. Uh, here at Romeo Rim, we are a leader in reaction injection molding or rim as it's known. And I always like to clarify with everybody that uh, it is not the rims like the tires. Uh, we do get that feedback quite a bit. It stands for reaction injection molding. Uh, so if you'll see to the picture to the right here, this is a picture of Romeo Rim. That is our headquarters. Uh, the snow is melting here and it's starting to shape up and look like that a little bit more. So we're excited about that. Uh, but we are located about 45 minutes north of Detroit. So all you Michiganders out there, you know, you can picture in your head me holding up my hand and pointing to where that's at on the map. Uh, but what we do is reaction injection molding of polyurethanes and polydicyclopentadine or DCPD as uh, it is well known in the marketplace, along with where the focus is on this conversation today of long fiber injection or LFI. Uh, so appreciate it. Uh, total, and we'll talk about this a little further of our capabilities, but total manufacturing square footage for us is about uh, 200,000 square feet, and we've got two plants located here in Michigan, just to give you a quick overview. Another important note, I think it's uh, something that differentiates us, so I wanted to share a little bit about the company too, is what our mission statement is. Really what we're working towards here is to partner with our stakeholders to create and deploy innovative solutions. So I think those key words that you can see there, partner, create, deploy, sum it up very well. Uh, we wanna partner with our suppliers, our customers, really be industry experts, which allows us to create innovative solutions. And then of course, ultimately getting those deployed uh, so our customers can realize that. So I think that's worth mentioning so you can get a feel and understanding of who we are at Romeo Rim. So let's jump into the technical stuff now. So what is LFI or long fiber injection and why do I care? So first and foremost, oh, got to click here. Uh, it is a two component liquid molding resin, uh, which is polyurethane for us. So unlike thermoplastic injection molding where you're taking beads of plastic and melting them down. We're actually using liquid molding uh, uh, resins such as polyurethane, which is a poly and an ISO all together. Uh, furthermore, it's a single step process. So we're actually taking the chemicals, mixing them right at the point of use and spraying those into a mold. And then next we actually uh, paint the cavity of the mold which allows us to eliminate the need for post painting materials as well. And then it's also a low temperature and low pressure process, which allows us to use uh, molds, maybe not steel, but an aluminum epoxy, things like that. So it's a quick overview, but 
really want to get to the image because I think it depicts it a lot better than I can describe here. So right now what you can see, and I'll pause this here, is the ISO and the poly recirculating here and they come together and mix. Really these wires all come up here in the mix head, but the ISO and the poly mix at the point of use here, which makes it a single step process. So there's no compounding of the resins uh, prior to the process. And then also what you see here is a paint. So as we talk about the need for uh, eliminating or the ability to eliminate post painting, we paint the cavity of the mold here. And the way it works is that materials come in together, they get mixed up here, fiberglass comes down and gets chopped, spray it right on top of that paint, we close the mold and that is the LFI process in a nutshell. So we've got a video that we'll go through a little bit later that'll really show the live steps, the real equipment, but just trying to get your head wrapped around what that technology is overall and some of the initial benefits we'll talk about. So as a step-by-step -step is how the LFI process works. First, which you saw on the last screen, we paint the cavity of the mold. Second step, we apply what we like to refer to as a barrier coat behind that paint, which is also a polyurethane. All the materials in the process are polyurethane, so they cross-link together. Uh, but once we put that barrier coat down directly behind the paint, we then take the fiberglass, which is in roving form. We then chop that and mix that all together with the polyurethane in the robot. We then spray that onto the cavity of the mold directly behind that barrier coat. And then the reaction takes place when we close the mold. So right now we'll take you through that step-by-step -step journey in a video so you can really see it because I know as well as I can try to describe it, it's not gonna be as good as a video. So if a picture is worth a thousand words, then this video will be worth, I don't know, a million, but here it is. So this would be a picture or a video of our rotary LFI press. We'll talk a little bit more about the capabilities of that press later. It does have individual carriers which the molds are on. So that's what you're looking at right now, a mold within a carrier. This would be the first step though, where the in-mold paint is sprayed onto the cavity of the mold. In this particular example, this is a two-tone paint application where we have the robot removing a mask. And now you can see painting that secondary paint. Once that paint is sprayed on there, it'll move to the next cell in this particular piece of equipment. And then you'll see a robot come out and this is spraying the barrier coat on it. So a totally separate robot that's doing that work. And that is right behind the paint, uh, giving it a lot of durability, a great adhesion binding because it is polyurethane bonding to polyurethane. Once that's sprayed, it moves down and I'll pause it just so I can kind of show you a still image of what the LFI process looks like again. So right here, what you're about to see is the glass rovings that I described earlier coming down and being pulled into the mix head. This thing in the bag here is actually the mix head for LFI. The rovings come down, they get chopped in a chopper unit, and the urethane in the prior slides that you saw is actually in these hoses here, and the urethane get, gets mixed in here. In this mix head is where all the polyurethane and the chopped fiberglass gets mixed so you've got good wet out of the fiberglass already in the mix head before it is sprayed down directly into the cavity of the mold behind that barrier coat. And I'll let you see that now. So now you can see the robot is spraying that material, that urethane and fiberglass mixture, right where it wants to be in the mold. Unlike an SMC process or something like that, where you'd be putting a charge down in the mold, this is spraying it right where we want to. So there's not that flow that takes place in there. We're putting the material right where we want it to be. Once it's sprayed on there, the mold will close as you can see there and it'll rotate around for the curing cycle. And then it goes to this station here, which is the D mold. So that's it in a nutshell. That overall cycle time is, uh, depending on part size, we always like to say anywhere from uh, a few minutes to 10 minutes for really large parts. And that just depends on the surface area that we're spraying the paint on and how much we're spraying the material. So that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> Hopefully that gives you a good idea of how that process works overall. So now that you've got an understanding of what LFI actually is, this is where it fits in the world. So you may have seen this chart before if you were in our last webinar or if you've been on our website poking around. But LFI would be this box that I'm highlighting with the mouse here. Uh, it is typically going to be larger parts. As you look at this scale, 
Up on the chart is large parts, down on the scale is small parts. We're typically in that medium to large part size for our equipment and capability. As you can see there, we've got identified that means about two feet by two feet all the way up to 11 feet by 11 feet or 11 and a half feet. And I'll show you that equipment capability later as well. Furthermore, if you look left and right on this chart, what it describes is that LFI really fits in the middle in terms of volumes, tool costs, and piece price units. So if you were to look left on this chart over here, stampings, injection moldings, those kind of processes typically are more automated. They've got high tooling cost, but the piece price is going to be a little bit lower, vice versa, of course, on the other side of that, right? Higher piece prices, lower tooling costs. LFI falls right in the middle range of that. Typically, the volumes that we see uh, that are a good fit for this are ranges down to about 500 units a year. That's typically when we see uh, customers being able to get a payback uh, for their tooling investment. And then applications, uh, even up 50 to 80,000 units a year I've seen out in the LFI. Uh, I do think that's probably a little bit on the higher side. Typically is gonna be more in that 10, 20,000 on the high range. But you know, if there's a need for some of the benefits for it, the technology has been and is used for those higher volume ranges as well. So now we know kind of in space where to use it. We wanna talk a little bit more about the benefits so you can get your head wrapped around that one. So I will be pretty brief on this. I'll bring them all up here just so you can see it and follow along. But some of the big benefits as you just saw, large parts. Now, a beauty of this is that it is a composite process. It does have fiberglass in it. And so you get very stiff parts. But with that, because it's a polyurethane resin, we actually foam that resin so you get stiff parts because of the fiberglass, but light weighting because we're using a polyurethane foam as that matrix material that's in there. So some benefits for that. One of the things that we always like to highlight is that what the specific gravity is compared to other materials. So typically we see this being compared a lot to sheet molding compound or SMC. LFI has a specific gravity of 1.02 compared to SMC where on a low density SMC, typically it's in that 1.2 to 1.3 range or another even fiberglass process is resin transfer molding or hand laid up fiberglass. You can see them even as high as 1.7, 1.8 specific gravity. So it's very, very lightweight in relation to those other composite processes while still demonstrating very good stiffness properties. Furthermore, some of the benefits, you saw in the videos that we can do in-mold painting with this process, and that's part of the benefit of a low pressure process. What that means to the end user or the customer is that uh, expensive post-apply painting is not required. That painting and that finishing is actually done all in the mold. It could be done with glossy finishes or textured surfaces. Now, if for some reason you did want to post apply paint the part, you could still do that and that in mold paint actually could be formulated to be a primer as an example. So that could be done if that necessary, it was necessary for that product. Because it's fiberglass and because we're chopping right at the spot, we can actually modify the properties as well. We can take the glass content up, we can take the glass content down, and that can all be done to change the properties and being tailored directly to what the part wants to be. So that's a pretty pretty important note. Uh, a lot of composite processes, uh, you are not able to change those properties. Typically it's more you get what you get because that's the way the material is made. As an example, in SMC, uh, you're gonna get the density that you get out of that and you're gonna get the fiberglass loadings you have all in the, the charge that's produced that gets loaded in the mold. Now to paint what the difference is for LFI, we can actually change the glass loading on the fly within the part by putting more glass in certain areas just by putting the mix head over there and spraying more fiberglass in there. So that's one of the benefits to tailor and optimize the properties. So pretty unique from that sense. With it, because it is a match metal mold process, you do get B-side features like bosses, ribs, and other things that uh, we'll get into a little bit further. And a big differentiator too is because it's a polyurethane reaction injection molding process, you can get thick and thin wall sections all in it. So we'll talk about what those limitations are, but to paint picture in your imagination now, picture a part that if it was a, a flat rectangle, you could have half of that flat rectangle be uh, three millimeters thick, 
but you could have the other half of that uh, part be say eight to 10 millimeters thick if you wanted. And that is possible. You are not limited to just trying to work within the bounds of a, a nominal wall thickness. And as we mentioned, it's a low cost process for molds uh, because of that low pressure. So you don't have to use steel, although we do sometimes. You can get away with soft tools like epoxies and aluminums typically. Now, onto properties in a little greater detail. Don't worry for anybody that would be out there. I am definitely not going to read all the numbers on that screen. Uh, I'm sure you're probably going cross side anyway. You can get this uh, copy of this table by downloading the presentation. But one of the important things to take away from this is what we had just talked about in terms of what the properties do in relationship to being optimized. So we can change the density because it is a structural foam as the resin used in this composite. So the table is illustrating here that as you take that density up, if you need higher mechanical properties, the density will go up and those mechanical properties will follow. Now, if you don't need the high strength out of it and you're really trying to optimize your cost, but you still need it to be stiff, you can actually lower that density by lowering that density of that structural foam. Now, as a designer and engineer, you just need to pay attention that as you lower that density, the mechanical properties will go down as well. So I just have to tailor that in, but it's great when you're looking to optimize the cost of a product. So you can take a look at the details of those uh, properties a little bit later when you want on your own free time. So what do you want to consider when you're designing for LFI? Well, it's a match metal mold, so you're going to get match metal mold types of tolerances. It's a fiberglass part as well. So the shrink of this material is going to be much less than say an unfilled plastic resin that you may be familiar with. So that's very important to understand what those tolerances would be because you're going to have less shrink in those parts. And it is really important when you have uh, dissimilar materials being bonded together. You really need to pay attention that this is a glass filled system. So it will shrink less than an unfilled if you're trying to join those materials together. So a good adhesive needs to be considered and you really need to pay attention to those numbers there. In terms of the wall thickness, we talked about that too. Uh, you can see here we can get the wall thicknesses down as thin as six, 60 thousandths of an inch, but we can take it up to a half an inch. And in a lot of cases, I have seen it where certain areas and parts where you need a, a thick mounting section or something to be a little bit more durable, you can do a half an inch, one inch, even greater than that in some cases. It really offers a lot of design flexibility on that one. So you might be scratching your head because if you come from the injection molding world, that's just not going to happen because you'll have significant sink or you'll even get voids uh, into the parts. You don't get that with the polyurethane resin here. So it is a feature of it. Uh, one other thing that we definitely always want to point out and make sure everybody fully understands is what is the tip typical draft that you have on this? So when you're designing a part, you'll want to have roughly a, a one and a half degree as a general rule of thumb of draft on that. Um, there are some nuances to it as well, uh, especially when you're talking about in mold painting. If we're talking about having a nice finished in mold paint finish on your parts, you're going to want to really have about six degrees draft overall on these outside features. And that's really just to make sure the part releases cleanly and you don't get any scuffing on these vertical walls. So those are important things to consider. The other important thing I really want to make sure comes across clear because we do understand this, we'd like to educate everybody on is that picture how the material was sprayed in your mind onto the cavity of the mold. We have an image demonstrating it here. As that material sprayed onto the cavity of the mold, if you were to see it pictured and sprayed onto this vertical wall here, the material will stick. But when that mold closes, that core feature will come down and it'll kind of swipe some of that material down. So we need to work together because what can happen if you don't put enough draft, you'll get lower glass regions in here, and then the design may not do what you want it to do. So we'll need to work together if you're interested in this so that uh, the design of the part will result in the piece that you want. Same type of concept applies for the B-side features of this. We can do all the boss ribs and all that in the back side of the parts, as you can see demonstrated on these images below. But again, an important thing to consider is that if you picture the material being sprayed into the cavity of the mold, all of those core features of the bosses and the ribs cut in the core are on the core side. You don't spray the material there. So what does that mean? It means that this is where the material lies, where my cursor is over it now. And as that core comes down, all the fiberglass 
is into this feature. And so it needs to flow up into that core feature of the mold. Well, what happens is, if you can see it here, all these little fibers demonstrated by the, the black lines, they try to migrate up. But really what happens is the polyurethane goes up and the fiberglass has a gradient where it goes from, say, a nominal of 30 to 35 percent up to zero in some cases at the top. We understand that and we know that in the design process. And so when we do our FEA analysis, we actually will plan on this being all polyurethane. So we make sure that the design works for the intent that it is but then we'll plan for all of this being the fiberglass. So uh, we know how to predict that. So it's important that we work together in designing the part right for your, for your needs. Another thing we do is fastening assembly. So you can see bonding of brackets here. Uh, another image here on the bottom right is uh, encapsulated fastener. So you can put metal hardware and inserts in here as well to get you a really good durable attachment on your parts that you're looking for. Now, that was high level. There's a lot there. We're happy to talk more about it, but I'm going to shift into gears for what the equipment is overall and what some of the, the benefits are of the equipment that produces this that at least Romeo Rim has. There are certainly other pieces of equipment that are out there, but we'll demonstrate it so because we know what we have and what the benefits are. The first one would be our shuttle press. And this is really focused around making large composite parts in the LFI process. Some of the highlights there are that we can make large parts, 11 and a half feet by 11 and a half feet. You can do part depths of 36 inches with draft being considered, of course. Shot weights of 80 pounds. And again, it's 100% robotically automated, just like the rotary press that I'm about to speak about. So as you can see, looking at these images, robots are our friends. We really like these to be automated processes. And as you can imagine, it's a highly controlled process of how all these materials are put on. So it's a big benefit from the quality of the product that comes out at the end of the day. Now, in terms of the rotary press, a little bit different reason why you'd use that one, but still some of the, uh, the main benefits of LFI exist here. Typically, we're looking at that rotary press for smaller parts. And I say that tongue in cheek because it's still an eight foot by four foot part that we can produce on that equipment. But you get some flexibility here. On that rotary piece of equipment, there are seven individual carriers that go around the track and go by these robots to get sprayed up. On those seven carriers, you can have seven different molds that actually get produced at the same time. So each one goes by individually by itself. But the benefit of that is, is it equates to lower cost parts because you have one operator who is demolding seven parts going or seven molds coming by at a time versus some of the other equipment where it's one or two. So that utilization of that uh, overhead rate is much better, which results in a lower cost part. Now, part weight or part depth on these is a little bit lower. So part depth on these, we max out around 16 inches. Uh, part shot size is a little bit lower as well with the part uh, being smaller, about 40 pounds. Again, 100% robotically automated and the seven carriers that we talked about before. Now, what are the tooling options? We mentioned it before, but this is a little bit better detail into what it is. Uh, for production, typically what we use is these three materials, steel, nickel, shell, and aluminum. Steel being a little bit higher cost, we'll use that typically for larger volumes, 10,000 units a year or, or greater, and high gla gloss finishes. Nickel shell will use for really large parts. Uh, the cost is a little bit less in some cases, but it does depend on the application. Get very good gloss out of that one, but the lead time is a little longer. So we can help guide what the right selection is for that. And then our most typical material that we use for our molds is aluminum. We get great life out of those volumes. Uh, I know that we have some aluminum molds here that are textured that have well over a couple hundred thousand shots in their use. Uh, you can texture them, you can put gloss finishes on them. And the nice thing about it is that you can make those molds a little faster because you can cut the material quicker. So there's some great options there. And that is the lowest cost option. In terms of prototyping, we can get away with epoxy molds or soft material types of molds because of the low pressure process. But typically you're only get about 200 pieces or so out of those uh, before you have to build a new mold. But it's a great way to produce um, Parts that are production representative, the only side effect that would be is that you may not get a high gloss finish out of it. You may just get a matte finish of it, but you can get production paint and materials that go with it. 
And then if you're just trying to duplicate geometry, there's always the hand laid up method that you can do as well. And that comes close to simulating LFI, but it's not perfect either, but it all depends on the budget you've got. Now, this slide is really for the engineers. So the intent of this is to, if you have a project you're working on, think about what are the materials that you're using and then think about what are the benefits. And the way you would use it is if you say you're thinking of a project that wanted to be injection molding in your mind, what would be the benefits? Well, if they may be a larger part, maybe you got higher mechanical properties you want and maybe you want thickness variation, this demonstrates that LFI perhaps could be a good material to use for that. You'd apply that chart the same way for these different materials. So something to consider and look at as well. Another tool here that is also in the slides is this uh, material selection guide or the process selection guide. So this is a great one for those engineers out there as well. You can also download this on our website for reference. Now, as we wrap up here, I did want to talk about some applications. So I know for myself, when I see a part or when I see it's used, that's the best way for me to relate what the function is. So I'll go through this pretty quickly because I do want to leave room for uh, some questions. But an agricultural roof here, uh, this is on the top of a, a cab that goes out on a combine. Uh, and it, the LFI material was used for the painting of it, low cost nature of it, and also that could, it could support a 300 pound load for that roof. Uh, another application is UTV roofs and doors, as the, you can see the door here, but also the roof in this one. It helped to lower the center of gravity, which allowed it, uh, the vehicle to pass a J-turn test. And it also helps to reduce some of the structure on the interior because it's a glass fiber, uh, fiberglass part, so it's very strong in nature as well. Another example here is a spa cabinet assembly. And so this is a pretty unique one in the sense that I'll show the video. Originally, this wanted to be multiple pieces that would all have to be assembled together that required a lot of labor. But by designing an LFI in the two-tone aspect of it, we're able to make the large side panels all in one piece and eliminate a lot of labor and put a lot more product consistency in it as well. So a great application for part consolidation there. Furthermore, another one in personal watercraft hall. So you can picture jet skis bouncing around the lake and doing all kinds of the crazy stuff that you probably do on those things. So has to be a very strong and durable type of product. Well, LFI and polyurethane in particular are great for that impact resistance and durability. So that's why this material was used along with the fact that you can put a whole bunch of B-side features and you can see the structure here with my cursor, the ribs, the inserts and the features to uh, make the design really what it was. This is another application where it was previously in vacuum forming with a metal frame around it. And because LFI has that fiberglass, we added some geometry to stiffen the part up, but we eliminated the metal frame altogether, which saved a tremendous amount of cost by really leveraging the properties of the LFI material. So I know I burned through that pretty quick because I want to be respectful of everybody's time, but if you're interested in this and you think you got an application to how to get started, the best way is to contact us. You can do it on our website or you can do it through those emails you see here or even a Google search works as well. But get a hold of us. We'll walk you through uh, what your application is. We'll want to get the models that you've got, uh, figure out what the application wants to be. So step three being the specifications and getting all those tolerances. And we'll work with you, guide you, get all that information gathered up and we'll set you on the right path for what you need. Now, with that being said, I will hand it back over to Brian to uh, wrap this up for us. Great, thanks, Matt, that was a lot. Uh, I think I learned something there, so. Um, <clears throat> but let's get to your questions. Um, there's a question box. Uh, if you have any questions, just enter one in. Uh, we'll do our best to answer it. Um, we do have one, and that is, what is the max part depth you can do? That's a great question. So it is process or it is equipment specific as we went through on one of those other slides, but really some things that are important to note is that 36 inch part depth uh, we can produce uh, for really large parts. You can get the draft that's in there that you'd have to be important to consider. So we'll really need to work with you because we wanna make sure that the fiberglass stays on those side walls and gets you the part properties you want. But three feet would be the answer to that on the equipment we have. Great. Uh, we do have another question coming in, um, but I just want to remind you, just uh, stick it out for a couple more minutes. I got some bonus material to share with you. 
Um, the next question is, can this use fire retardant material? Great question on that one. So I'll try to answer it as well as I can. Um, but if I don't answer it, please feel free to reach out and give us a call as well. Uh, but we do know that with the LFI material that uh, this does meet FMVSS 302 uh, vehicle standards for flammability. Uh, so that is one aspect of it. But I do know that with the polyurethane, uh, there are some limitations for interior types of applications. In particular, the urethane does not meet a docket 90 specification in the mass transportation industry. So there's some nuances to what the specifications are and the requirements. Uh, so with the material, it's important to work with us and understand that. In terms of flame, fire retardant materials to put into it, fillers, additives, things like that, um, we'd probably need to understand the application a little bit more to see what's possible. You can add uh, additives to the material, but would really need to know what that target end use is so we can make sure if it would meet it or not with the urethane materials. Great question. Okay, we'll take one more question real quick. Um, can the B side be painted? Great question. I love this one. We talk a lot about this one here. So I would say typically in most of the applications that we work with, just the A side of the part is painted. And that is because it typically wants to be the show surface, glossy finishes, textured finishes, whatever the case may be. Now, you absolutely can paint the B side of the mold, but there, of course, with everything, there's caveats to that. You can paint the B side of the mold, but you are not able to achieve the same surface uh, and quality finishes that you can on the A side. And that's because if you think about how we would spray the materials, it would be spraying on the cavity and also the core and materials could drip off of the core. And so we have to be very careful and cognizant of that. So quick answer there. The short answer would be class A surfaces on the A side of the mold or the cavity side. The B side, yes, you can paint, but the, the surface finish quality will be less. Okay. Well, we are running three minutes over, so we'll end the Q&A here. I want to thank everybody for joining us. And like I said, as promised, I will share with you our bonus material. Uh, the first one is the Composite Material Selection app. We put this together to uh, allow you to vet the um, process for choosing a appropriate composite material. So you would go to romilrim.com slash selection app where there are five different um, uh, what do you, uh, parameters that you would enter um, and at the end of that it will spit out a suitable uh, material that you should start researching. Um, this is just meant as a guide so that you can eliminate some of the processes that aren't a fit and research for yourself the processes that will be a fit. So we hope that this will help save you time. Uh, the other piece of bonus material is actually in your handout section of this webinar where you can download it. Um, it's also available on our website. Uh, but again, it's just a summary of the various uh, materials that are available, uh, composite materials that are available uh, that you can use as a, kind of a comparison chart. So uh, feel free to download that uh, right now in the handout section, or you're welcome to uh, visit our website, and it's also there. Um, so um, that being said, our next webinar is going to be an introduction to dicyclopentadine, and that's a mouthful. Um, DCPD, as it's also known, is a, uh, a material that is used many times when composite materials are required. So if you haven't heard of DCPD, uh, I urge you to uh, register for this because uh, we'll talk a lot about that and its application. So uh, that will be Tuesday, April 30th uh, at 12 p.m. Eastern Time. And also, finally, I encourage you to follow us on the various media. Um, we've, we constantly produce content, uh, LFI related, DCPD related, and that sort of thing. So uh, you'll get some value out of that. So that will be all. Thank you very much for um, attending and we hope you've got some value out of it. And again, please share this uh, because we feel if you think it's uh, valuable, uh, likely your colleagues will think it's valuable. So. Thank you again, and we'll see you April 30th.